Get the latest Impact Podcast right into your inbox each week. Subscribe by entering your email address at impactpodcast.com to make sure you never miss an interview. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigeri, and I'm so honored to have with us today Peter Salkner. He's the Managing Director of Veta Pharma. Good, hello, Peter. Hi, John. Good morning. So it's great to be on the show. Thanks for the invitation and opportunity to talk about Feta Pharma and the impact of our business and what's going on around the company, sustainability and, and so forth. Uh, Thank you, Peter. And, you know, it's it's so kind of you. It's morning here in California. It's evening in Germany where you are right now. So thank you for staying a little later and and uh, and uh, uh, agreeing to come on our podcast. You know, Peter, before we get talking about all the important work you're doing at uh, Better Farmer with your colleagues, can you please share a little bit about your background? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to get your education? And how did you get on this journey to even start with? Uh, even though I do not look a day over 30, but uh, <laughs> I'm 50, 57 in the meantime. And uh, so I had been around the block quite a bit in this industry. So I started my career early 1992 with uh, Zatorius. And um, so I worked uh, two times in my life for two companies. So two times for Zatorius and two times for Vedder. But before I joined the workforce, I um, studied chemical engineering. I have a master's in chemical engineering from the University of Dortmund. And later on, I had the opportunity to get my MBA from Columbia University in New York, which was a fantastic experience to do that in the United States. So collectively, I used to live in the States for almost 19 years, wow. uh, flying across the ocean all the time, working for um, uh, German headquarters um, in, in uh, with Atoris. It's, it's the same thing as for Vedder. Both have a commonality. They are both family-run businesses. Uh, even though Zatoris in the meantime became a relatively sizable publicly traded company, but uh, Federer, uh, it's it's really a, a great story story as well. We'll get to that in in a, in a second. And um, yeah, so I, I was born and raised in in Germany. Um, was was born in the town of Essen, which is in the Ruhr area, pretty industrial area there. Um, so specifically in the mid-late 60s, going into the 70s, it was a completely different environment. So the, the, the hometown where I grew up had at that point in time more than 30 coal mines. So none of that is in existence wow. anymore. It was a complete transformation at that point in time. Everything what we discuss right now, transformation of industries as well, going away from, from certain things, changing the automotive industry, um, pharma biotech definitely being at the forefront, uh, which is a great industry to work in. And um, yeah, so that, that change was, was consistent. And as I indicated before, I used to live for five and a half years at the East Coast, relocated to Germany for uh, four years before I lived almost 13 and a half years in California and uh, had a lifestyle to really fly every single month back and forth. And yeah, I was really wondering how that story 
will end at a certain point. The um, pandemic gave me a relatively quick answer. There was time for us to pack our things and relocate back to Germany and uh, really to help to manage the company here at our corporate headquarters together with my uh, colleague Tom Zotto and the Vetter family and the entire management team. So, so you're back in, in Germany with Vetter Pharma. For, and, and, and for our listeners and viewers who want to find Peter and his colleagues at Vetter Pharma, please go to www.vetter-pharma.com. Explain, Peter, before we get talking about all the important in, in, uh, things you're doing in sustainability at Vetter Pharma, who is Vetter Pharma, how old is the company, and how big is it, and how wide-reaching is it, so our listeners and viewers could hear from your perspective, per, 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 perspective the history of Vetter Pharma. Yeah, so Federal Pharma was was founded in 1950. So we have a 73-year-old track record. And uh, Federal Pharma developed out of a smaller pharmacy here in the historic downtown area of Ravensburg, Germany, which is really in a deep part of southern Germany, where Austria, Switzerland, and Germany gets together in the Lake Constance region. And um, so uh, Helmut Vetter, the founder of our company, was a pharmacist at that point in time after World War II. He had certainly that idea as a very young pharmacist, how to package certain pills. He had his own little uh, innovations and, and some pills which could help you when you had an upset stomach and how to package it. He used aluminum foil and created his own little machines. And since he did a wonderful job, as a pharmacist asked him, if he could package some of their products for them. And that was kind of the idea, the initiating idea to go into the packaging business. At that point in time, the company did everything except something which was sterile. So that later on uh, took place in the first time in the mid 70s that we tried to really fill first sterile products. And in the meantime, uh, Fetter uh, grew to a uh, one billion dollar business this year. We, in the meantime, um, yeah, have a little bit over six thousand two hundred employees within the company. Wow. And what we do is we do as a contract manufacturing organization fill and finish services, so drug product services for the who is who in pharma biotech to um, go into pre-filled containers such as syringes, vials, cartridges. And on the other hand, to secondary package some of those goods where it goes into pen applications, order injectors, or just to put it into blister foil in the cardboard box with the little leaflets in 26 different languages and, and the artwork and everything what you have to create to ship it out to patients uh, on a global scale. And we when we talk about high value biopharmaceuticals, so we are definitely not in the over the counter drugs. So usually, if you need a product which is filled by FETA, we have some, some serious topics ranging from oncology products such as cancer products. Um, we have uh, products uh, in, in our portfolio um, in, in, the, in the orphan drug arena, so relatively rare diseases, only a couple of thousand patients around the globe are suffering from these type of diseases, but that can really uh, range from, from certain uh, neurological disorders to um, children's Alzheimer's disease. There is such thing that even in the age of one to three, uh, that can be observed and there are drugs on the market or a specific drug on the market, which can definitely cure this type of disease. You find us in um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis applications and, and so forth. And uh, we work actively with the Who's Who in Pharma Biotech with all the big 20 pharma and biotech companies as they are listed according to their market capitalization, as well as small starter companies. Sometimes you have smaller companies. Um, they have a slick molecular idea and they are looking for a partner who understands the regulatory requirements with the FDA, with the other global authorities such as EMA, and uh, you, you name it. So we definitely have to understand that what we have to do in our business and uh, fill those services. And we have two, um, I wouldn't call it necessarily business units since they're intertwined. There's a pattern development service, 
where we really help clients within the clinical phases to get from point A to point B and then to prepare for, uh, for success in clinical phase three before a product gets approved for the market, uh, that we do all the necessary work, uh, have a sterile filling, get even product out there to clinics to test the products and uh, then prepare for the market launch. Well, we definitely do that on a daily basis for launch products. We have in the meantime, roughly a hundred products in our portfolio, what we ship uh, around the globe. And you will not find us uh, on any of the packaging formats. We are strictly in the business to business environment, but uh, yeah, the pharmaceutical and biotech industry knows us quite well. That's wonderful. And, you know, um, I see some of the products. Are those some of your products right there by your by your elbow? This is some of the yeah, products. Yeah, so, so just, you know, so that, that maybe our, our viewers have a real yeah. idea. So this is, this is here one of the FETA specialties, a so-called dual chamber syringe, where you have a lyophilized part of the drug substance in this piece and the diluent. So basically, which solves this lyophilized piece prior to the point of use. So you have a little bypass, and uh, basically by mixing those two substances before you get it into the patient, you um, basically dissolve those those molecules uh, again, and uh, or that that is basically a another syringe format. It's a one ml format. You have um, under this cap here is a temper evident cap. What you find over here, and um, you can basically attach a needle with a lure lock combination. So some of that I've seen that definitely at the doctor's offices, how you do that, and then inject it into the patient. This is in another format, a so-called vial, a little glass flask, which is sealed by a rubber stopper and a crimp cap, uh, which is uh, right. out of aluminum you know, with some plastic and so forth. So that is usually used in clinics, an oncology product for cancer, for example, oh. where a medical professional would apply it to a patient. Uh, that, that would be kind of a typical format. Here you find, uh, for example, so-called cartridges. So the cartridge itself goes into an injector, an auto injector, so a device where you can just push a button and inject it into the patient's belly, for example. In the home care market, it's, it's uh, quite effective. So uh, it's probably best known from insulin applications out there for diabetes patients, but that is utilized for infertility as well. So if really families uh, cannot get really a baby and, and really need a specific hormone treatment over a certain span of time, that would be kind of a typical application here. Uh, including uh, growth hormones as well. If you, if people have, uh, and specifically children, have growth disorders that comes into play, and it comes in all kinds of formats here. You see that with the little vials, you know, and we have even bigger ones, up to 50 milliliters. So that is really the smallest format here and everything in between. And Federer entertains one of the most complete portfolios in the market uh, to deal really with the uh, different um, uh, formats from syringes to vials to cartridges. On the other hand, it is almost irrespective what type of glass is in the middle or what type of device uh, we are usually um, yeah, taking into, into, into the whole project as a specialist to handle complexity. But in the meantime, we really have to deal with uh, very complicated formulations and, and really very sensitive molecules as well. And how to do that, how to get it sterile, uh, into a syringe. Um, there's another great example what comes to mind with, for example, products in our portfolio for age-related macular disease. Yeah. Uh, so if not treated, the patient will go blind and you have to inject into the glass body of the eye a monoclonal antibody. I know that's a whole mouthful of what I'm just saying, right. uh, but it has a viscosity of honey. Yeah, so it's and and really every droplet counts. You have to have an extremely high dosing accuracy. Right. On, the, on the other hand, it has to be sterile. If it is not sterile, the patient will definitely lose the eye. And every little particle which is in that syringe would swim lifetime long in the glass body of the eye. So these are really the, the type of of um, uh, 
high quality applications, we, we try to get to the market. And I think it would be fair to say without Feta, some of those products wouldn't be on the market. So that's where we became really a specialist in that, in that field and really tried to play there in the Champions League and lack of a better term. So to be among the best in the business out there. Uh, without really bragging, but I think that's not an exaggeration, but uh, we are quite good in what we're doing. So among other things, you guys are experts in efficacy. Efficacy matters in what you do. Uh, yep. You know, precision and e efficacy and quality really matter. Um, you know, which brings me to another topic. I mean, Germany is known for quality of everything you manufacture in Germany. Your company is 73 years old now. My experience in my travels is Germany and other parts of Europe have been way ahead of the United States and other parts of North America and other parts of the world, frankly, on, on this uh, culturally speaking and socially speaking uh, with sustainability. You've been way ahead of us. It's a generational thing. It's baked into your society. Talk a little bit about when it became part of the DNA of Better Pharma during the 73 years that Better Pharma has been in existence. When did sustainability become a part and parcel of your offering? Well, if you talk about sustainability in the meantime, in the political discussion and everything what we talk about today in the social media, it gets sometimes confused with just CO2 carbon dioxide footprint. Yes. However, sustainability, as we see it here at FETTER, uh, is really going with the UN Global Compact, which uh, goes with 17 different disciplines, which really entails... Uh, ecology, economics, and the social aspects of sustainability. And if you really take certain portions out of those 17 um, um, topics, certainly in the 1950s when the company was founded, uh, we were not really discussing uh, carbon dioxide footprint. Right. However, it was always a family-run business. It right. was always this, this, this Swabian area, we call it uh, Upper Swabia here, that part of Germany where we are. And those folks, they are well known that they are pretty frugal or efficient, however you want to call it. So with that said, so that it's, it's really in the DNA of the company, it's in the DNA of the region. It's really where uh, people still on Saturday swipe the streets with a, with a broom. And that is definitely um, pretty pretty good um, to run a sterile business in this type of environment. Um, uh, so from, from, from that standpoint, yeah, it, it had been really in the DNA of the company. On the other hand, um, we, we always try to be at the forefront when it, when it comes to uh, the uh, ecological aspects as well. So we had really a, a task at hand where we built... Um, almost 13 years ago when we start to break ground for a new warehouse and competence center for visual inspection, which is a massive building. So we talk about a building roughly uh, 22 meters high, so 66 feet, and then actually has a depth of approximately 150 feet by a length of approximately over 400 feet. So you can imagine so that, that building will be there for quite some decades. We had to think about it. What do you do with a building like that where you have to store on the one hand API drug substance sometimes at minus 70 degrees. You have um, really fill product 2 to 8 degrees centigrade. You have huge spaces in terms of warehousing. Um, you have a vast majority where you do visual inspection, where you need climate control as well. So what do you do with a building like that when you build it? And uh, that was even prior to the entire movement, what we have experienced five, six years ago with Fridays for Future and, and other, other movements where it became more in central stage to think about CO2 footprint, uh, what type of impact it has on the environment as well. So what we did actually 12 years ago is that we came up even with contracts with local farmers. And we do entertain for that building our own biomass power stations. So we installed photovoltaic on the building. We have geothermal applications there for the heat exchangers, so where you gain energy. And on the other hand, we decided with the company, and I'm happy to report that uh, in the meantime, all the electricity we get to the building 
is uh, actually um, uh, from, from hydropower, since we have the Austrian Alps relatively close by. So we are in an ideal situation to entertain that. So with that said, uh, we became in 2021 CO2 neutral within the company. Wow. And uh, yeah, so we were definitely at the forefront of that. But it's really a journey what you, what you entertain there. And yeah. it's never a complete journey. As, as good as you are, it's the same as, as in sports. Yes, you're great, 100 meter dash, world record, but that really doesn't mean that you cannot run faster. Yeah, and you have to at a certain point in time because, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think um, a task we, we all have to have to entertain as an, as an industry. So the farmer and biotech industry definitely has a sizable footprint when it comes to carbon dioxide. Uh, so uh, we always have to find a compromise here as well. Um, since we are bound by regulatory requirements. So we cannot just say, okay, well, with the AC, we don't take it that accurately, and the um, air exchange rates in the clean room, uh, we are bound by regulatory requirements. There, there are clear validations how you have to run the clean room. What type of temperature profile do you need? What do you do there in terms of uh, the, 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 the entire uh, clean room application? And uh, on the other hand, you have to balance that with, with other topics where, for example, you go into the biomass power stations or you come up with photovoltaic or you have an idea where you buy your energy. So with that said, um, yeah, it definitely has an uh, impact on the entire supply chain. So our customers as, as well, they're definitely in that outer third circle, what we discuss in the meantime a lot within the industry. Uh, it's always good that uh, we, we did our homework already and that we are already there with um, CO2 neutrality. You know, that doesn't mean we cannot get better. But sometimes, you know, little things count. Yeah. Well, while I'm standing here in this building, we opened that in the midst of the pandemic in 2020. Um, it accommodates approximately a thousand um, yeah, desk workers. Uh, wow. So, and, and uh, on, on the other hand, we, we were definitely, um, yeah, we had the task to find out what do we do with the daily waste we create at our desks. So what we decided is that every single person is going to a central trash can, which is somewhere in the central part of, of each floor and, and brings the trash there him or herself. So mm -hmm. with that said, hey, you have an idea what you create per day. On the other hand, it saves the company some money as well. So you do not need really a whole crew cleaning up after a thousand people. Uh, and it's really kind of a mindset question as well. Uh, it's the same as uh, that you have motion detectors in, in every room. So if somebody forgot to switch off the light switch there, it will not burn all day long. Uh, so these are the little things. What do you do with the water you utilize in your bathrooms? And then, and so all of those little things pile up as well. And that's the only chance how you really come up with, with a sustainability report where you can really claim those type of things, as I mentioned it before. If, if you've just joined us, we've got Peter Salkner with us. He's the managing director of Better Pharma. He, we're talking today. I'm in California. Peter's in, 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 in Germany, and he's at his corporate headquarters uh, in, in Germany. You could, if to find Peter and his colleagues and all the great work they're doing in the pharmaceutical industry and also in sustainability, please go to www.vetter, V E T T E R pharma. Dot com. Peter, you mentioned the sustainability report and all the big things you're doing with regards to energy offsets, all the little things you're doing in sustainability. How often do you publish your sustainability report? And are they are, are all the reports cataloged then on your website? Uh, yes. So the first time when we came up really with a full-fledged sustainability report, um, it's uh, and that, that almost is... Um, yeah, 70 plus pages was uh, last year in 2020, uh, the 2021 report. So we just right. published the 2022 report. 2023 it will be done in the makings. So there are two reports and they're on the website. On the other hand, we only printed a couple of leaflets, which are six pages strong uh, with a QR code, which really gets you to the 70 and 80 pages. So we had to really save the German forest a little bit, you know, talking about <laughs> sustainability. Right. We cannot just print a sick report. Right. 
Um, Peter, in, you know, in your industry, packaging matters uh, nowadays, especially since um, sustainability has become a bigger thing, not only in Germany anymore, in Europe, but around the world. This whole issue of sustainability and the shift from this uh, linear to circular economy and ESG principles have all really become institutionalized with regards to the investment community, um, uh, Wall Street analysts, and also your constituents and clients who get to enjoy your products. Talk a little bit about um, uh, what your thoughts are around sustainability and improving product packaging now and in the years to come. Well, what we definitely see a trend uh, together with our customers in, in secondary packaging. So uh, for, for those uh, viewers who, who just uh, joined us, so what we do, we do prefill containers to get really sterile medication into syringes, into vials, and into cartridges here. And uh, so that is primary packaging. So we cannot alter too much what's going on there mm. because um, it, it's usually a type one glass or a very specific plastic syringe right. out of CUP plastic, for example. And there is always interaction between the pharmaceutical solution and the wall of, of the syringe body, for example. So you definitely, uh, you cannot just freewheeling choose alternative materials. They're right. validated. You have a track record there. You have documentation about it, which goes with the Food and Drug Administration in the US or the European Ministry uh, of, of, of Health here, or the EMAR or the Anvisa in Brazil. Um, so it's, it's a highly regulated industry we are in. However, in the secondary part, where you put those type of syringes, usually in former times, it was all plastic. Yeah, you try to put that into blister foils and, and uh, really put it into a kind of a more rigid box. So in the meantime, what you find is, yes, there's still some blistering with alternative materials, sometimes uh, biodegradable materials. And then the good old cardboard box in, in a more advanced way is now at the forefront. What, what, what you see, what companies are asking for, that they really want to go to packaging formats where you can uh, utilize cardboard boxes, how it gets shipped out to the patients. So sometimes with a little coating on top of that, but which is still uh, environment, uh, uh, environmentally friendly and, and it's definitely biodegradable uh, instead of the yeah, tons of waste we would create just uh, with, with the outer boxes and all the plastic we would create in that industry. So there's one way where we can definitely go into that. On the other hand, sometimes when it comes to auto injectors, um, um, it's um, sometimes hard to uh, justify to go to applications where you can use the same injector again and again. Sometimes you have that for patients who get the same consistent medication every single day but uh, for some of them, it is just a couple of shots they do need. And uh, yes, uh, it goes into plastic. So the industry right, really tried to go into, into plastic, which would be recyclable. On the other hand, you deal sometimes with residuals of medication, which is in there, for example, a cancer drug and so forth. Uh -huh. So that even has to be um, put into special um, waste bins at the pharmacy or where you bring back your, your goodies and not just throw it into your domestic waste disposal. Uh, so that, that, that is something which is uh, quite, quite special. On the, on the other hand, um, it, um, it, it, it starts with, with uh, smaller topics as well. How, we, how you get um, all your goods you bring to the clean rooms and so forth, the other packaging there, do you have a waste disposal concept? Do you recycle your materials? You collect all of that on site, what you utilize around the clean rooms. And we have a full fledged program running around that. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where it really starts at the local manufacturing level. But when it comes to shipping it out, we are somewhat limited with the exception that there's definitely clear trend towards cardboard boxes and secondary packaging. I have to, I have to, this is, I'm stepping away from sustainability for a second because it's become such big news in the United States. Um, uh, this new trend of um, the diabetes drugs now being used for weight loss 
and weight management, which then can make other great effects in a person's body, blood pressure improvements, um, of course, heart improvements. Are Is, is Better Farmer part of that uh, ecosystem of Wegovi, Ozempic, and this whole new uh, huge trend of, uh, of these medicines being used for, for weight management? Out, out, out of confidentiality uh, reasons, okay. I cannot tell you the exact company and products. Okay. However, so the so-called GLP-1 analogs, yes. so agon-like proteins. Uh, so, yes, we are a part of that. Right. So I have some knowledge about those, those, those type, type of drugs. I think um, for a diabetes patient, it has a tremendous benefit. So right. after every piece of cake you were eating before, you prick your finger to draw some blood and to figure out what type of insulin you need at that day. And here you basically um, just uh, inject yourself into your belly with an injector, for example, once a week, and your right. body is or has the ability to regulate the insulin itself. So wow. for a diabetes 2 patient, it is a, a massive benefit. Instead of almost every single day, once or twice, you, you prick yourself uh, to draw some blood or you get some insulin injections and forget that now on a GLP-1 analog basis where you have that application once a week is huge. So right. now... As a side effect and benefit, what came out of the clinical programs, it uh, showed that people have a weight loss 10, 15 percent of their body weight, um, which uh, can be certainly a huge benefit for really obese people. Uh, so have, for whatever reason, has some psychological effects or the metabolism doesn't allow them really to uh, co completely um, reduce the weight in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, there it certainly has a benefit when it comes to cardiovascular diseases or other side effects which come really with massive overweight. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not so sure with a uh, body mass index of 30, I think certain athletes would qualify for that because their muscles are that heavy. You know? So right. I'm, I'm not too sure if we are really pointing in the right direction for every person who is taking that at this point in time as a lifestyle drug. It's just Peter talking, my personal belief. Right. So I'm, uh, I wouldn't utilize it. I'd rather go three times per week to the gym and try to keep somewhat fit. Right. But 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 better farmers benefiting from this whole new trend because you get to make more packaging to support those industries. Yeah. On, on, on. Yes. In theory, in theory. It, yes, yes. In theory, yes. It okay. is certainly it's a pharmaceutical and biotech biz, uh, business is a business. Abso right. Absolutely. Right. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, we, we certainly take some ethical pride as well. What, what, what we manufacture that is really meaningful, that it really makes a difference in people's lives, that can right. be really life changing or life saving, even with right. some of the medications we manufacture. And, uh, but on the other hand, I've, I definitely have to say um, that um, the advancements the industry made in the, in the last decade is, is uh, tremendous, tremendous, including those GLP-1 analog drugs where I just explained what difference it makes yeah. to somebody who's suffering from diabetes too. Huge patient benefit there. Right. Right. Well, back to sustainability. You know, Peter, you've done a made a great case for everything important that Better Farmers working on. You're working on big things such as energy offsets and becoming carbon neutral. You're doing small things like in the in the beautiful new office tower that you launched a couple of years ago in terms of waste management and and the shift to the circular economy. You're working on packaging. What are what are some of the initiatives that you're allowed to talk about that are most exciting about you that you that are coming in the future because as you well said and, and our listeners and viewers have come to know sustainability is truly just a journey there's no finish line we can all be better we can all be better as individuals and as corporations and as organizations so what are you excited about uh in terms of the future sustainability initiatives that you're working on peter with your colleagues at better pharma yeah so uh it's, it's definitely to uh even by, uh, I'm, I'm just looking to, to the other side here, outside of the window of, of our little foyer here. Um, 
to a brand new manufacturing building, which will accommodate uh, four additional filling lines, uh, where, cool. what we are under construction. And by just thinking about how you construct such a building, how do you have your energy streams there? What is the layout? How do you do that? What type of, of materials do you utilize and, and so forth has a massive impact already in the, in the building phase. And, and certainly you cannot really ask for great results after you didn't really do the work from the design phase on when you when you come up with with uh, with with, your, with with the growth of the company and it's definitely fair to say that we are massively investing into additional buildings we're expanding our business we have to prepare for success we have over 200 projects uh, in the pipeline uh, together with our customers in the different clinical phases as you know not every clinical phase material will be a commercial success and will make it to the market but there will be a vast majority of products which will be launched at a certain point in time, and we have to prepare for that success. So it's, it is an expanding company. We have to think about really how we create our, our factories. What do we do in terms of the building layout? On the other hand, what we have launched as well, and it doesn't stop there, are really initiatives that we um, in, um, have that kind of bike uh, to, to work initiative. And in the meantime, over two and a half thousand of our colleagues um, got to lease uh, on, on, a, on a really uh, economical basis uh, bikes. They ride to work. Uh, we have charging stations here. We, we basically have um, a whole stable of, of um, where, where you can really put your bike underneath a roof, and which is which is highly modern and so forth. So specifically in this environment where we do not have really great public transportation. That is different in the bigger German cities, but it doesn't hold true here in the more rural areas. So, uh, but it's still remarkable that a vast majority of our staff chose that route and that they are biking to work, that they do these type of things. On the other hand, um, so sometimes when we talk about sustainability, as I mentioned it before, uh, we do not take really social aspects too much into consideration. Mm. So. So now for the 10th year, so we just had uh, a little anniversary there, we have the so-called FETA Kids Initiative. So what do we do? So kids here in, in Germany, is the same as in the US, but it's a little bit different spread out here, have 13 weeks of vacation, while their parents look on five to six weeks of vacation. So mm -hmm. with, with, with that said, there is a misfit. What do you do with your children when sometimes, you know, um, schools uh, have closed their doors and, and so forth, or with the little ones. And we run every single vacation, a, a great program where we have kids camps, where, where you can really uh, go for the teenagers into IT classes, English courses, or for the smaller ones, really where they're more playful. We have a soccer camp, we have a tennis camp, you can go to Lake Constance and learn how to sail a boat and so forth. And we, we sponsor that um, big time from our company, take care of the community. Uh, we encourage even with, uh, with gym passes here uh, where people can get that with a relatively small dollar um, to utilize all kinds of gym facilities in the environment and so forth to keep themselves healthy and fit. And, and we have all kinds of programs supporting our staff. So last year we had actually um, the opportunity um, that we got an award, the um, sustainable Impact Award um, here in, in Germany uh, was an impact on employees. So, which was another aspect of sustainability. Yeah. Uh, to, have a, to be CO2 neutral is one thing, but to see more all-encompassing according, uh, according to the UN Global Imp uh, Com uh, Compact, that is really the name of the game. Because without a sound understanding, with a change of behavior within your staff, you will not achieve those type of things. It's true. That's true. As you said, it's ecology, economics, and social. It's not just like you said, car, you know, it's like you said, it's not just about, about decarbonizing our companies and our society. It's so much more. It's, there's a holistic approach to sustainability that obviously Better Pharma has adopted and is, and is uh, accelerating. Absolutely. 
Well, look, look, Peter, thank you so much for staying late. I know it's it's at, it's 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 we're we're nearing seven o'clock p.m. in Germany. Uh, it's just the morning here in California. And because sustainability is a journey, uh, we want you to continue to come back on the Impact Podcast and share the journey of sustainable in sustainability at Better Pharma for our listeners and viewers to find Peter and his colleagues and all the important things that they're doing at Better Pharma in terms of making products that not only change lives, but potentially making products also that save lives and also all the great work they're doing in sustainability and re and read their uh, sustainability reports. They're on their website. You could go to www.better-pharma.com. Peter Salkner, Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for all the great work you're doing in the pharmaceutical industry and making us healthier people around the world. And also thank you for the work you're doing in sustainability and making the world just a better place. John, thank you so much for that opportunity that we could present a couple of things. What is happening here in, in the central part of Europe at Feta Pharma it was really fun to be on your show and hope I have the opportunity to talk to you soon and to report about our progress. Thank you so much. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. <laughs>